our own story. And today we're going to talk about fighting for our future. You say the word fight, and I think it almost brings about a negative connotation in the world today. Like, man, you shouldn't fight. You shouldn't be in a fight. But all throughout Scripture, we are reminded that we are called to a fight as believers in Christ Jesus. And your future is dependent upon your willingness to engage and fight the good fight. We've been looking at David, and we're going to study from Maybe the most popular story around the life of David, which is where David, this young shepherd boy, fights a giant named Goliath. And it's found in 1 Samuel chapter 17. But I just want to set a little bit of context for you here. When David arrives at the battlefield to face off with the giant Goliath, he's not showing up with the intention of being in a fight. He's going at his father's instruction to deliver some goods to his brothers and to check on his brothers. And when David gets there, what he begins to discover and see is that there's a giant named Goliath that is a Philistine. And he is taunting God's army, the, is, the, the army of Israel, day after day after day. And Goliath is taunting the army so much so that King Saul literally sends out a decree and says, listen, anyone that will fight this guy will be exempt from paying taxes. Some of you are like, where's Goliath, right? Then King Saul doubles down. He says, not only will you not have to pay taxes, but I'm going to let you marry my daughter. Now, history tells us that King Saul's daughter, McCall, was actually very Beautiful. So imagine being a young shepherd boy and you arrive on scene and you're like, hold on, what's going on? This guy is taunting and he's talking trash and he's running his mouth. But if I fight him, I don't ever have to pay taxes and I get to marry a fine boo. That's not all bad, right? Until you realize the rest of what David is facing in this moment. See, Goliath stands at around nine feet tall. His armor weighs 125 pounds. He's wearing a bronze helmet. He has a bronze javelin. And Goliath actually has another soldier assigned to him to do nothing but carry his shield. So David arrives on scene, and this is what happens. In 1 Samuel 17, picking up at verse 26, it says, And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Like, is it true? I don't have to pay taxes and I get to marry this girl? I love what he says next. He says, For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That he should defy the armies of the living God. Who is this giant that thinks he can stand against God himself? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We honor you in this place. And God, I I come to you with sincerity, asking that you would have your way, that you would speak your words to each and every one of us, and that we would have a willingness to receive and respond. God, make us better. We say all of it in the precious, powerful, mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said a great big. David has a risk to reward analysis that's going on. Am I going to engage in the fight and potentially receive tax-free status and have a wife that I can be married to? Or am I going to remain on the sidelines? I imagine David going like, what happens if I don't fight? What happens if I do fight? What happens if we get victory? What happens if I fight and I lose? Will we become slaves to the enemy? Like, like what is going on in this moment? And David makes a decision that he's going to fight for his future. And you and I, every single day of our lives, we have this cost analysis going on. Like, am I willing to take my next step in my journey toward Christ? Am I willing to engage in the spiritual fight that it takes for me to make progress in my individual life? Like, am am I willing to pay the price? 
Am I willing to actually get in the fight? And can I tell you, simply put today as we begin this conversation, that God's plan for your future doesn't just happen. You have to fight for it. Is everybody encouraged? God's plan for your future doesn't just happen. You have to fight for it. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Everyone say future. God has a plan for your future, but I don't know about you, I've never received a plan from someone else that required nothing of me. Every time I get a plan from someone else, it requires me to do something toward the future that is designed for me. Have you ever received a gift that became more work than it was worth? It was a few years back, and my wife's grandmother, Bobby, buys all three of my kids drones. Now, these drones, they came off of QVC because my wife's grandmother, like, she's obsessed with QVC and the Home Shopping Network. I mean, every single Christmas gift my kids have ever gotten from Bobby and Carl came from the QVC. And here's what I've learned. QVC, that's like a devilish company, right? They sell the, they sell the junkiest junk you've ever gotten in your life. And so we get these, th- we get these three drones from QVC for Christmas, and we get home, and I have to open them up. And, and i got to find batteries that will fit these drones. And, and the kids are like, they're, they're chirping at you, right, because you're not moving fast enough. And they need the batteries faster, and they need the control. And you got to understand something about my household. Like, we're not big fans of instruction and patience. And so, like, they're like, come on, Dad, like, like hustle up. And so I get the batteries in all three drones, not one. Three drones, and we go outside with the drones, and I'm telling you, these drones are so fast, they'll make your head spin, right? So the first drone goes up, that drone flies to heaven, never to be seen again. The Lord called it home. And I'm like, maybe we should read the instructions. Like, I'm not sure we're qualified to run the QVC drones in this particular moment. And so the second drone, it goes up, it meets Jesus too. I mean, we're 0 for 2, right? Like these drones, they're gone. They're gone forever. I mean, never to be found again. And I'm telling you, it happened fast. This isn't like, oh, I think I got the hang of it. Oh, it slipped away. No, I'm talking like off the ground to heaven. Boom. So I'm like, okay, hold on. Like, like y'all suck at drone driving. Give me the controller for the third one, right? Like, get out of the way, right? So now I'm going to drive the drone because surely I'm more qualified to drive a drone than they're qualified to drive a drone. And so this drone goes up, and I'm telling you, this drone doesn't make it to heaven, but it does make it into the woods. So now I'm tromping through the woods looking for a QVC drone because my kids have already seen two go to heaven, and we've got to redeem this third drone that is lost and wandering through the wilderness. And as I'm tromping through it, all I can think is, like, I'm not even sure I want to celebrate Christmas anymore. This is just not worth it. (laughs) Now, my wife's grandmother, Bobby, she had a great plan. She saw these drones on QVC and thought, you know what? The kids are going to love them. They're going to have so much fun with these drones. It's going to be so great. And the moment that she passed those drones to us, it required something of me to fulfilled the plan that she had for us to actually enjoy these drones. Now, many of us find ourselves stuck in the journey with Jesus. And and we celebrate the resurrection as we did last year because it is the free gift of grace that comes into our life by faith and by faith alone. But at that moment, once we've received salvation, many of us go like, well, what do I do now? God has a good plan for my life and for my future, right? Yes, and we celebrate that, but you've got to get in the fight. You've got to be willing to walk through the woods just a little bit to find that which you are missing on your journey to a better life and a brighter future. See, the Bible teaches us about a good, caring, loving God, and the Bible is also abundantly clear that you have an enemy, and you have to be willing to fight. We see it 
all throughout Scripture. We see it in 1 Timothy 6 and 12 where a guy by the name of Paul is writing to his protege, Timothy. And here's what Paul says. Fight. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Paul's like, Timothy, listen, you made the best decision in your life. You confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Now, here's what I need you to do. I need you to take hold of the eternal life that you've now been given. I need your perspective to change. I need your priorities to shift. you got a little bit of work to do in the plan that God has for you so that you can inherit the bright future that he has for your life. I need you to grab a hold of that eternal life, and as a result of it, you'll fight the good fight. You'll become engaged in fighting the fight of faith. In Ephesians 6 and 11, the same guy Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, and he says this, put on all of God. God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. I don't know about you, but if I'm putting on some armor, I'm anticipating a fight. I'm getting ready for a battle. Psalm 144 and 1 says this, Praise be to the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. It's a very real fight that believers in Christ Jesus are constantly engaged in. We've got to fight for our future. So here's just a few thoughts on fighting for our future that I pray will help you engage and take your next step toward Jesus. First thought is this. It's actually a quote from Margaret Thatcher. It says this, you may have to fight a battle more than once to win it. You may have to fight a battle more than once to win it. It's a reminder that like, hey, we don't give up on the fight just because it isn't immediately going our way. This past week, my family and I, we we went on a little vacation just to take a bit of reprieve. And I took my three kids snow skiing for the very first time. And I was worried about this trip because snow skiing seems like a real boomer bust activity for young kids, right? Like they're going to love it or they're going to hate it. And and so the first half of the first day, we went to a little ski school, you know, teach the kids how to ski a little bit. And really what I was thinking is there's only two parents and there's three kids and we need some extra help. You know what I mean? And we go to ski school the first half of the day and I'm telling you, it started, it was bad. All right? Like my oldest two, they got it. My youngest son, Ben, I mean, like he has no patience. He wants everything immediately. He's fighting it, and it was bad. It was so bad that later in the week, I'm on a ski lift with Ben, and he looks at me, and he says, hey, Dad. I said, yeah. He says, you know that first day when we went to ski school? I said, yeah. He said, I was bad. I said, yes, son, you were terrible. He said, but I got gooder. (laughs) I said, yes, sir, you did. And he got gooder. Right? So on day three, because at day three, you got to be an expert, right? Day three, you're clearly an expert. And so we get off of a ski lift, and we're at the, the, the crest of the hill. And, like, this, this, is a, this, is like, this is a real slope, right? This isn't like the gradual. I mean, this is like the, like, you know, you're kind of like peering off the edge of the world looking slope. You know what I mean? And, and Ben looks at me, expert, third day, and he says, watch this. So I pulled my camera out, because what else would a good dad do, right? I mean, I looked, the poles had pads on them, he's going to be okay. And I'm telling you, that sucker turned him downhill. I mean, straight downhill. And, and there's a jump, there's a jump about, about 200 yards straight downhill, down the steep slope. And I'm video, I'm not going to show you the video, because that makes me look like a bad dad. But I'm, I'm videoing from the top of the mountain, because I'm like, I know where this is going, right? Like, like, it's day three. Like, he an expert. I know where I'm telling you. That dude hits the jump. Both legs up. I mean, th- like, splits. He falls. Looks like he hits his head. I'm not sure. The jump's high enough. I couldn't actually see the landing. You know what I mean? I got the camera out the whole time, though. Just so proud. Just such a great moment in my life. So I zoom down the hill because I'm going to check on him. I see him. Like, there's a ski over here. There's a ski over here. And he's standing here, and he's doing this. And he goes, did you see that? I said, yeah, you got gooder. (laughs) 
He didn't want to quit because he crashed. No, he said, let's do it again. And he goes down that hill the second time, and I'm telling you, he turns them straight downhill, and he hits this jump, and the exact same thing happens again. And I zoom down the hill, and I'm helping him put his skis back on. He says, let's do it again. And then he does it, and he lands it, and then his brother and his sister are like, I want to do it now. I want to land it, and they go over and over. Now, here's the question for us. How is it that at seven doing an activity we can understand that I may have to fight the fight more than once to win it? But all of a sudden we turn 38 and we get into adulthood and we're on our journey with Jesus and we think it's just not fair that I would have to fight the fight more than once. Can I encourage you? You're never good at anything in the beginning. Yeah, we, have, we could give Jesus some praise. You're never good at anything in the beginning. So you have to keep fighting. You have to keep engaging. You have to keep taking steps of faith. You have to keep moving toward God. And in this context, we're not talking about physical giants. We're talking about spiritual battles and spiritual warfare, which is the resistance that we face that wants to prevent us from moving closer to God, from taking our next step. That's the battle. It's in our mind. It's in our spirit. It's in our faith. It can't be seen, but spiritual warfare is very real. And I know I say something like that, and many people get immediately uncomfortable, but I need you to understand something. You are an eternal being as a believer in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul's saying to Timothy. He's like, no, 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 I need you to grab a hold of your eternal life. Not this temporary, temporal one because you're not made for this earth. And when you begin to understand that you received the gift of salvation and you now have an eternal hope, you understand that you're a spiritual being. So fighting in the spiritual makes perfect sense. And it's where we engage in our battle. See, we visualize fight and we think MMA, a boxing match, a battlefield, but the physical fight is the lowest form of fight that we will ever face. Spiritual fights are the fights that we face trying to keep us from taking our next step. And I just want to give you some examples of how spiritual warfare manifests in our life to hopefully take some of the weirdness out of it and to allow you to see that you're in a fight whether you want to be or not. Spiritual warfare shows up in the distraction. Do you, do you, ever, do you ever just like, maybe you wake up a little late, now you're rushed and you got to get the kids to school, so you're like, I'm not sure if I can get, get to that Bible plan I was going to work on today. It's a distraction. You ever open up like a physical Bible, I know it's weird, and like try to read it? Every emergency of everyone in your life will occur the moment you crack this puppy open. You ever wonder why you fight with your wife and kids on Sunday mornings trying to get to church? How about that moment of doubt? You're about to take a step. You're about to make a move. And that doubt begins. That, that moment of insecurity. I'm just not good enough. I don't measure up. I need you to understand something like... God did not make you to live in doubt, in fear, in anxiety, in depression. All of those are forms of spiritual warfare. And I pray that you see that you're in the fight and that you've got to fight for your future to be able to take your next step. And I hope I can give you some encouragement when I say this. Everyone has resistance on the path to purpose. Not just some people. But everyone battles spiritually. Everyone has these moments of distraction, of insecurity, of doubt, of fear. I didn't plan to share it the first service, but I did, so I'll share it with you guys too. Like the, the Easter, the resurrection season is always a season of, of great spiritual warfare. The enemy knows that more people are going to come and hear the good news of Jesus around that time than any other time. And so it's just, it, it for for. It was our seventh Easter, and for seven Easter's, it's just like, it's just a battle. It's just a fight. It's just, it's a grind. And it shows up in different ways. Like sometimes it's, like some years it shows up in, in conflict. Some years it shows up in, in, in just like frustration. Some years it shows up, you know, in, in a financial struggle or like, man, how are we going to afford, like, but this year, 
like it, it showed up in my life, and I, and I didn't recognize it immediately, but it showed up in my life because the week leading up to Easter, I had this overwhelming sense of insecurity and of inadequacy. And, and I'm not saying any of that to, to, I don't need anyone to feel sorry for me. I'm, maybe, I'm in a good space. I talked to my wife about it, and she told me to suck it up, to get up off the mat, to get in the fight, to get in the game, and to move on. We're good. But my point is that all of us face these, and, and I had to recognize, hey, this is a spiritual battle. Like, th- like this, is spir- this is the enemy trying to convince me that I'll never be good enough to lead this church into this next season, and through this next season, and to the places that God's calling us. I wrote four Easter messages. Yeah, we're good for four years. Over 40 pages of content, knowing that there's a 30-minute time slot in which anyone can possibly absorb what what God wants to speak into that room of people. Just out of this overwhelming sense of inadequacy and insecurity and uncertainty and doubt. And the moment that that I paused myself long enough to recognize it was spiritual warfare, I could then get in the fight the way that God had called me to be in the fight. And I got alone, and I spent a lot of time alone that week. Just seeking God, seeking his face in the word, in prayer, just just away from all of the distraction. If you don't recognize that these things, these doubts, these fears, these anxieties, if you don't recognize that it's spiritual warfare, you'll never get in the right fight. You're always trying to fight physically what is actually a spiritual manifestation in your life. Here's the second thought that I have. Don't make it your goal to avoid stress. Make it your goal to be your best in stress. See, the enemy uses stress as a tool. It's like, why would you say the enemy uses stress as a tool? And and I want to be clear. I'm not saying that you should subject yourself to undue stress or unnecessary stress or that you shouldn't rest or you shouldn't have safeguards in your life. But the enemy will convince you that the moment you feel pressure, the moment you feel stress, that you should retreat, that you should back up that you should go a different direction. The enemy will use just, just an inkling of stress to push you off course and to get you out of the fight so that you try to avoid it. But we as believers have to understand that because the fight is very real, we have to have a certain tolerance to the stress and the pressure to push into it so that we can push through it, so that we can make it to the other side. We can't always try to avoid stress. And and can I say it with a little bit of challenge? There's no such thing as a meaningful, stress-free life. Never seen one. There's pressure, right? But pressure's where babies are born and diamonds are formed. Like good things come in these moments where there is pressure, where there can be some stress. And we know the warnings of it, but simply trying to avoid it isn't enough. You have to learn how to deal with it. And rarely do we ever talk about the fact that there can be some upside to some pressure in our life from time to time. Think about all the meaningful things you have in your life. Think about your marriage. There's so much purpose in your marriage. But it's stressful. And there's pressure in it. Think about raising kids. It's so good and so purpose-filled. But can I get an amen that it's stressful? Yeah. It's pressure filled, right? Like, is my kid smart? Is my kid dumb? Is my, can my kid run fast? I don't know. According to Facebook, everybody's raising a prodigy but me. It's unbelievable. Your kid got 48 ribbons. There are only three available, but incredible. Wonderful. Sell those things on Amazon. We're just sticking them on walls to stick them on walls. It's stressful, right? Maybe some of you are new to the faith. I know some of you are. Can I encourage you for a minute? If you talk to somebody that's known Jesus for a really long time, let me tell you what they're going to tell you. There's some pressure in following Jesus. But there's diamonds being formed in following Jesus. There's good things happening as a result of that pressure. I'll say it like I talk. You can't grow without the grind. You can't grow your marriage without grind. You can't, you can't grow in raising your kids without the grind. You can't grow your business without the grind. 
And here's the really good news, and here's why we don't have to run from the stress. God is in the stress. He's in the difficult times. He's in the good times. God is in the stress. Yeah, take your timeouts, Take your rest. But don't forget that some of God's greatest works are in pressure-packed situations. Think about David. He's just delivering some food, checking on his brothers. And he walks up and he's like, hold up. Why are we letting all this go on? Why are we allowing this? Hold up. That's a pretty pressure-packed situation, the thought of this like 5'5 five, five shepherd boy going to fight a 9-foot tall giant with a javelin and 125 pounds of armor. That's a pretty pressure-packed situation. Yet David didn't run from the stress. He ran to the giant. He ran into the pressure-packed situation. Why? Because he had a faith that said, my God is with me. Every single step of the way. And some of you are finding yourself in this crazy, wild, stressful place. Don't let the pressure drive you away from what God has for you. Stare down the giant and declare that the Lord is sufficient. That you're here on mission. That you have a divine assignment. Scripture says that we are more than conquerors. So we don't back down. We fight for our future. Isaiah 43 and 2 illustrates it well. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Notice there's still some floods and there's still some rivers and there's still some fire. But God says, I will be with you in those moments. And thought number three, the last thought is this. Your greatest enemy is not the giants in your life. It's how you see yourself compared to those giants. See, we're scared to fight because we're scared to lose. We just don't feel like we have what it takes to be in the fight. But can I tell you that not fighting isn't actually an option. It's just a guaranteed defeat. Here's what I mean. There's no bench in the fight of kingdom versus culture. There's no sideline. You're in the fight. It's kingdom or it's culture rising in your life. What One of the two is happening for each and every one of us, every day, every decision, every relationship. And I love David because he's like, hey, that giant may be big, but I'm bigger on the inside. And, and Goliath is like, he's trash talking for days. He comes out and he taunts an entire army. He trash talks so long that the king says, you don't have to pay taxes and can marry my daughter if someone will just fight him. And I love what David does. He does a little trash talking back. See, David said, you come at me with a sword and a spear, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. And we read it in scripture and we're like, oh, that's just a very noble. No, he's talking trash. He's like, good for you, bud, but let me explain something to you, Goliath. And then you know what David does? He, like, he doubles down. He's like, oh, by the way, Goliath, because I come at you in the name of the Lord, I'm not here to give you a black eye. No, no, I'm going to take your head and I'm going to feed your carcass to the birds of the air. He says, I'm here to fight and I'm here to win. Not because of what I can do, but because the Lord God himself is with me on this journey. David said, listen, listen. I know it may not look like I can win, but as we've already studied in this series, he's like, no, no, no. I fought the lion, and I fought the bear, and it was preparing me for this moment, and I know who was with me when I fought those, and he's still with me today. Let's take that concept and apply it to the fight inside of us you got to speak to that negativity, to that self-doubt, to that fear, to that anxiety. And you got to say, no, 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 no. I'm here to fight, and I'm not just here to fight, I'm here to win. See, the power of the death, burial, and resurrection is that that is the final victory. Do you realize this? 
Like when Jesus Christ defeated death, hell, and the grave, he took the power from the enemy. So when you go to battle and you fight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are fighting from a place of victory. And all you have to do is have a commitment that says, I'll stay as long as I need to stay, I'll fight as long as I need to fight, and I'll keep declaring the name of Jesus over every obstacle, over every evil, over every distraction, over every doubt, over every fear, because I know my God is with me. So we fight for our future. I love it because David declared the giant dead before the stone was even in the air. David made a move with no guarantee. Just out of pure faith. So here's just two brief action steps that I pray will help you have the confidence to get in the fight. The first is this. Become more concerned with who you're becoming than what you're accomplishing. Become more concerned with who you're becoming than what you're accomplishing. The enemy will often use our accomplishments to distract us from who we are. The enemy will push us into accomplishment while tearing down our character, our foundation that God is trying to build in our life. You see, defeating Goliath isn't about this singular accomplishment in the life of David. It's part of his journey to kingship, to fulfilling God's ultimate purpose for his life, of setting into motion the Davidic rule that would lead to the soon coming Messiah that would set free all of humanity. It's not about this singular accomplishment, and I love David so much because David reminds us that we have to become obsessed with God's glory, not our own. Notice what David says. David says, who defies God's army? Not King Saul's army, not his brother's army, not his army. He says, who defies God's army? David looks at Goliath and says, I come at you in the name of the Lord. David says, my God protected me from the lion and the bear. These are glory-shifting statements. And when you get engaged in spiritual warfare, I'm telling you, when you begin to shift glory and give God honor and praise and adoration and thanksgiving, when everything in your life seems like it is falling apart, the hand of God will begin to touch you and lift you and raise you. And God will honor your words as you say now for Christ's glory I will endure anything anywhere anytime I'll pay any price the answer is always yes and the second thing is simply this recognize that your future will be determined by your identity I'm going to share this real quick There's a passage in Numbers where God's people are wandering through the wilderness and and, and they're trying to make it to the promised land. They're trying to get to the place that God has has promised them that that is a fruitful land. And so some spies go into the promised land and they find some grapes and they're like, oh my gosh, look how fertile this land really is. It really is as good as God said that it was going to be. But then they see some giants. And so the spies come back and they're like, hey, listen, listen. Man, listen, like that land, that land is good. That land is everything that God said it was, but we look like grasshoppers compared to those giants. We just can't go there. We're not ready for that. We're not ready for that. They acted like God was surprised. Like God didn't know that there were some giants in the promised land. So you and I have to find our identity in Christ Jesus and recognize that he knows there are some giants on the journey. 
And he's not surprised by the giants. He was aware that the giants would be there. He knew the struggles you would face. He knew the temptations that would come your way. He knew the trials and the hardships before you ever made it to them. And he's already made a way through them. It just simply takes you saying, no, I'm a child of God. I'm a part of a royal priesthood. I'm more than a conqueror. My faith can move mountains because my God is good and he cares and he wants to lead me into the future that he has for me, I simply have to be willing to fight. And can I just end with this? It's just a simple reminder. My dad taught me when I was a young man. He said 90% of winning a fight is simply being willing to fight. Can I tell you that 100% of winning a spiritual fight is simply being willing to fight in the name of Jesus Christ. You will win when you engage for his glory from your place of identity as being purchased by the blood of Jesus that was shed at Calvary for you and me. Heavenly Father, we love you. And God, we praise you. And God, we honor you and we glorify you and we lift up your name in this place. And maybe you came in the room today and you would say, yeah, Jacob, I get it, but like, I'm tired of the fight. I'm beat down. I'm heavy. I'm worn out. Like, there's just a spirit of heaviness on me. I just keep doubting. I keep fearing. I keep getting anxious. I'm just so unsure. Would you just slip your hand up and give me the opportunity to just pray with you? Father, I thank you for every hand raised. I thank you for every life represented. I thank you for the fact that they would raise their hand saying, no, 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 I'm here. I'm going to fight just a little while longer. And God, I pray that you would just make your face shine upon them and be gracious to them. Can we just stand to our feet all across this place for just a moment? And so many of you raised your hand. And can I just encourage you? We're reminded in Isaiah chapter 61 that we have an opportunity to trade a spirit of despair, a spirit of heaviness for a garment of praise. Meaning what? Scripture tells us that one of the ways that we fight off the heaviness of this life is to praise, to to lift our voices, to, to open our mouths, to sing praises to God. Why does that matter? Because what we're doing is we're acknowledging the character of God which reinforces our identity and who He is. When we sing of God's goodness, it reminds us that we have opportunity to be His reflection on this earth and it strengthens and empowers us. So just for the next few moments, we're going to set aside every distraction and every attack of the enemy, every anxiety about what it looks like or what I sound like, and we're going to lift our voices and we're going to praise the name of Jesus and we're going to trade that spirit of heaviness for a garment of praise in this house. Can I get a great big amen and let's give Jesus some praise.